Now, actually, I think this was a nice connection with the plenary um, discussion session now, uh, which we will have before the coffee, coffee break. Um, and the idea is to, to discuss about the needs and challenges um, of um, open data uh, development, open geodata uh, development. Of course, some of them are common with open data in, in general, but for, for spatial data, we have a little bit more uh, specific problems a, a, as well. Um, and partly also um, the presentations uh, that we had so far actually show some lessons learned and some uh, ex experience regarding to that, but maybe we can discuss um, a little bit further. Uh, also, incorporating some other aspects, because as also it was highlighted by, by Monica, by Tom, and uh, by Freck also at the beginning in the welcome speech. Um, today, may, basically with the presentations, uh, we focused on, on the research aspect of open, open geodata, <laughs> but we have also the education component and also the capacity development component, uh, to which ITC is heavily uh, interested in. But at the same time, actually, our understanding from, from the presentations, that's also something um, Open Geo Hub is also uh, specifically interested in with the summer school and, and the training activities. So maybe we can also discuss um, these this aspects. Um, so um, I took some notes, actually. Uh, maybe just to initiate some, some discussion, I, I can briefly talk about the things that I, I, I saw so far. Uh, and then maybe we can, uh, we can, we can get your, your feedback or your, your ideas about, about those things. So um, one important uh, aspect also uh, highlighted by Mosumia was uh, that the data sets uh, gets abandoned uh, after, after some time. Um, basically, um, in most of the presentations that we had today, they were linked to a large research projects. So in fact, they had resources and means to make the data uh, available, available in an easy way. So that you, in some of the project, they, they had their own data uh, portals, which people can connect and get the data, right? But this might be something luxury. So maybe for the PhD uh, presentations that we will have. So um, and eventually, it might be possible for them to have access to this kind of resources. But in most of the cases for master thesis studies, for PhD studies, and also for some research projects, we have to use existing repositories, and that becomes partly, part, partly, partly a challenge. Um, Leandro mentioned, for example, their somehow collaboration with Zenodo, but in fact, Zenodo is only a, a, a kind of a, a file, um, file repository, so all the things that you put there are available for download only, but nothing else. No, no, no. Huh? Uh, uh, HTTP service, so if you put the cloud of the GeoTIFF, you can open it in QGIS without downloading Okay, uh, yeah, but it, yeah, okay, I see. So it's the HTTP file access, but still it's a kind of file access that we are talking about, right? Because you... No, you, no, you can, if, you have a, if you upload to the Nodo cloud the optimized files, they work as a geospatial database. So you have a posting of a geospatial database. Uh, okay, but it's file-based, so basically you need to know which file you, you want to request and the extent that you are, you are interested in, right? So it's not like accessing a data cube and asking for for, for data. It is. It is. It is. It's just, it's, uh, you have to have the addresses of all the files. Exactly. Exactly. So, so uh, if you have them, then it works. It's truly like a problem. Yes. Problem. Yes. Yes. So you need some connection points to, to, to create. You need to know what you're doing. Yes. E exactly. Exactly. So, um, 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 uh, so that might be an issue that maybe we can discuss about how we can, uh, we can, we, we can make, um, and the, the, uh, the data uh, pub publicly available in an accessible way uh, for, for master studies, for PhDs, or for may maybe for, for small, small projects. Um, and another thing um, Tom also mentioned was the data formats. So basically, he listed some, some data formats that they are using, which are, uh, for example, these cloud-optimized uh, geotips, but at the same time, GeoParque and similar uh, formats for, for, for vector data. Uh, which are state of the art, but at the same time, when we con consider the, the research committee in general, they are also uh, found uh, to be difficult to, 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 to use some, somehow. Um, one example I can give, so uh, there's this data, uh, Dutch uh, data award, maybe you, you heard, heard about it, so it's an annual award given to uh, specific data sets. And the winner for last year uh, was Nadia Blumendal, and um, um, 
somebody asked her um, how she made her data set easily accessible because he, she had many downloads, a huge number of downloads, and she thought that she provided data as a CSV file. And that was the trick for her to, to have um, more downloads, more accessibility, because CS, C, CSV, CVS files are very easy to process, but with any, uh, well, by, by almost a, anyone, it's not a good format for geospatial data, but it helps with this kind of thing. So I, I wonder your, your uh, ideas about this. Um, yeah, maybe these are some starting Don't points. Use yeah. <laughs> Don't use CSV. Yeah. Don't use CSV. Maybe we, yeah, we can start with it. Uh, Tom, do, do you want to comment on this? Uh, yes, the, um, on the client side, it's okay to have um, diversity of formats. You increase usability. Uh, and f if somebody just queries a little chunk, then it's, it's okay, uh, you know, JSON, CSV, XML, whatever, that's all fine. But um, on the um, backend side, uh, the, the best is to have a cloud-optimized data. That's it, very simple. Learn how to make cloud-optimized data. That's the new, new yeah. standard. <laughs> that's new standard, that, 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 yeah. that's true, but and, uh, how and we then can... The issue is the metadata, so if you have a cloud option geospatial data, then um, ideally, I think a step further will be that the metadata is inside the file, right? So you can do that in cloud options. Uh, although it's breaking now, there were some issues. Um, but uh, so the, the next step beyond that will be also to have metadata in the, in the same file. So just make a one file, cloud option file, can be large. We have a whole Europe, 120 gigabyte images, but it's no problem because you open in QGIS and, you know, if you just need a like little subset, you download one megabyte. You don't. You will. You'll be just streaming like a tens of kilobytes. You know, so there's no problem. But the new standard should be cloud optimized. Very simple. Mm -hmm. Leandro. Uh, yeah, uh, I fully understand the issues that you are saying about the formats, and I think it's, uh, in my uh, my view, I, we are really like uh, experimenting this transition between old formats and these new cloud native formats. And if we think about all these cloud optimized geotiffs, geoparkers, so we have, they were not there like four years ago. So, and we are just starting with that. And I think it's important to understand why this transition is happening, because the amount of data that has been produced uh, in, in the last years, it's just increasing, and it will keep increasing. And if you think about 10 years ago, all these like geo server standards or, or, or these OGC standards, they, they work in a way that you have a kind of service that it's a, we, we can call like a, a midware, but it's basically you have a client, like a, a software component doing the intermediation with the data. But if you grow a lot the amount of data and really like for like terabytes, this component will be a bottleneck, so you need to scale up. So basically, the, the trend now, you, we are basically removing this software component between the client and the data, and the client accessing directly the data. And you need to organize uh, uh, on the this, this data format in a very specific way to optimize and make and take advantage of these new standards. So, and, but it's, it's difficult and it's challenge because all these formats are changing. So even GeoParque, it's not, it's not there yet. You have a specification, this community is working to develop it, but you have not a full stable implementation for, for it. But I think it's important to understand that maybe in five years, like we will have most of the data in this format. So that's the time to starting work with that. And if you think about, for example, the Copernicus program, they just starting a new, like, big, big, big initiative to convert the whole archive of the Copernicus to cloud optimized the geotiffs, and, and because it's easier to access and it allows, like, uh, different ways to, to, to work uh, in a very distributed way. Uh, but he, there is this transition period. So we, I think we just need to be, be prepared and, and and uh, like work together to, to really uh, starting development uh, in, in a more like, in a product, in our workflow, in a production way. 
In the other hand, you have this metadata transition also. So for example, all these new standards uh, that you have with, because you have them, this new data sets that are now organized in cloud optimized GeoTIFF and you need to have like a different way to organize metadata also. So for example, in our perspective, the, the stack it's actually the next generation for the metadata because you will have like, I don't know, thousands of layers and you need to have like a time step and a date time of information for all these layers. So you need to automate it in a way that it's not possible just like fill like a form in a geo server or geo node. You need to automate in a way that really allows document like millions of files. So, and also we are experimenting this transition now. All right, so I want to comment on the, on the other perspective from like how can we learn to, to process this kind of geo, geo data instead of CSV file because in the beginning, we all five students, we come from the even bachelor degree or master degree, don't have any knowledge about how to deal with special data. So we are more, most of the people are likely to deal with uh, in Python about CSV file, about, I, I don't know, about image J, uh, JPG file. But they, if they want to transform into a, a spatial world, they have to learn uh, how to deal with T file, how to, deal, how to learn how to, to deal with COG file. For example, my, my first degree is not, my first and second degree is not in, in any in, uh, remote sensing. I mean, I'm studying agriculture and I'm studying environment management, but I self learned this kind of material online. So I think the proper way to do that is like, if we have to promote this kind of field, like to make it circulate on the, on, on, online and make people really easy to access it. We, still, we also have to know, let them know, oh, what is the, what is the advantage of, of we using this file as we, maybe we educate them, we produce some uh, video, produce some tutorial online to let them self-learn online because now there are so many information online and we have to learn by ourselves, we have to have our own self-learn ability to actually uh, improve our research, to, to actually do our research and actually work in this uh, high, high changing environment. So I think the, the best way for now is not to, to probably to, to back to per, uh, produce CSV file. It's instead we, we produce uh, COG, we produce uh, COG file, we produce GLT, but we also give a tutorial why we use this file and how can you use this, um, use our tutorial to actually learn, to master uh, special analysis. So it's my own opinion, thanks. Uh, any, any, any comments or suggestions? So actually that, that's a very, very valid point because eventually just um, uh, putting the data somewhere where people can access doesn't make it open, <laughs> right? So as Musim mentioned, we have this fair principles and maybe it's just F of this. And that's, to be honest, from my point of view, is partly also partly questionable because even if you use a, da a, a proper uh, data repository, it doesn't guarantee that people will find your data set. Because the, the typical way to, to, to find the data set is through this uh, a narrow AI search mechanisms, right? So uh, unless the, the repository is properly actually indexed uh, by this search, search, search engines, um, people may have difficulties in finding it. Um, so, uh, okay, now uh, I will start with Bob. Yeah, thank you. Um, we were involved in the uh, EU project uh, called Core Climax, EJ, and I were involved there. At that moment, the discussion was about climate data. And uh, if you say, I would like to use a climate data record of uh, length of temperature or liver index, millions of <laughs> different data sets will come up. You don't know which one to use. Uh, so then the, the climate, um, uh, Copernicus climate services was that, uh, you know, they had to make a uh, what they call a kind of uh, uh, authentic data, a location where it is created, so that you know this data set is the one that is somehow certified with certain type of uh, quality standard uncertainties are there, all these things. And then you define all these different data formats, 
uh, two data formats were uh, adopted. One is GOT, for another is uh, GRIP. It's not GRIP, it's GRIP. This is a climate test because they have to, it's a binary because you have to access it very quickly. Therefore, this is a kind of format. So I think, uh, I don't know exactly what they want to make in this new Copernicus kind of data. Uh, I mean, the Copernicus data is a headache because you have to somehow get it into your system. Uh, and another system, I mean, nobody talked about it, is Chechia uh, is using the um, Google Earth engine. Uh, I mean, Many people are using that. They have a kind of quite good data, data structure. The way is that the thing you want to process, or you want to visualize, does not need to be loaded into the memory. But uh, I'm not doing too much of this data <laughs> related things. So I, I, I thought part of this is one is more from, um, as I see it in the past, it's more, more people use it, even if it's not a very good system, it's, it's still adopted. Right. Another one is that it is such a super efficient system that eventually people will have to use it. Somehow it seems you have to balance that. Yes. Actually, it, you know, it, it, it has good a combination of uh, ingredients that are necessary, right? So because when we talk about the data, okay, making data accessible is important, but actually nowadays because the data is big, a co-located data computing is also something most of the time necessary. So yeah, we can download, but why we download if the computation can be done there, right? Uh, so for, from that point of view, uh, yeah, uh, Tom has some comments, so let's. Exactly what I want to talk about. I, I asked that question for, like people have this, just uh, use it as a phrase, open data, but there is a definition of open data. So number one is the, the open data license. So for example, NC is not an open data license, even though it's also Creative Commons. Then the second thing, it has to be um, in the open format, right? You could have an open license, but the, the data could be in some format, which you have to pay, right? Um, then the third thing is that it's uh, uh, unrestricted access. Imagine you could have open data, but if somebody wants to use it, has to pay you, right? Is that an open data? Um, I would say no, probably. So it has to be unrestricted access. Um, and then it's that it's available uh, that the cost of download are the minimized, right? So when you, because you could have also some data, but you have to pay the transfer, you have to, you know, it's a cumbersome to download. Um, or, or it's not available, you know, it's like you, you say, well, it's open, but I cannot access it. I, you know, you have to request it, I don't know. So the question is if you put data in Google Earth Engine, right? So you said you have master students, and then you could use GeoNode, but it's a cumbersome, you have to maintain it, you have to extend it. So why don't you just say, everybody, publish your data in Google Earth Engine, right? Because in Google Earth Engine, you have to import it, you have to write up something. And it's immediately available. People can visualize, make an app, you know, uh, like Professor Bob said. Just go, uh, go and play with it. Uh, but the question is, is it, if it's in Google Earth Engine, is it open data? That's the question. Because if you want to download it, you need to log in. So you have to uh, log in. And you have to use Google Drive to download. And that's the catch. That's the catch because if you want to then download bigger and bigger data, you have to pay Google. So, and then the question is, is that still open data? But of course, you know, Google is a commercial company, they have to pay salaries, they're not publicly funded. Uh, so they do have to make an income, you know? And so there's no, you know, free meal, there's no free hosting, um, except for Zenodo in these places, but they also host only 50 gigabyte buckets. We quickly, like I think three years ago, we ran out of space with Zenodo. It's like we make project 10, 10 terabytes. So what, what do we do with Zenodo? We had to send them like lines of emails. Can you extend the buckets? You know, we have these images, whole Europe, 120 gigabyte. And luckily they responded, so they said no problem. But uh, in principle, there's no free, free meals. I mean, you have to think how to do it, right? So. But question from everybody here, I have a question. Is it open data if you have to log in and you have to pay for Google Drive to download? That's the question. Is that still an open data? That's what I would like that somebody comments. Yeah. Any comments on this? Yeah. Actually, I have a 
Fury Spear as a as a solo developer. So I can I would say I don't like the, the login system any any and any form of login system. It's like I always provide my information online. They gotta always send me another like new 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 set of, new, new setter and everything and sometimes they will start charging me and like, I need to disable my my account. So I always, I always when I would sell developer something, I always have to use this like open source like and download to my comp to my workstation. I can work, and and then that is the only way I can actually maintain. I actually make sure I I am I have my own um, like my I own ownership of the data and I can use it at any way according to the license. So <laughs> I I usually. I, I, yeah, in the past, I used Google Earth Engine, but I found out like because I'm not in academia, so I can't. Read, I don't have the support from the school, from, from the university, or any research uh, uh, institution. I need to do everything privately. But I have to I have to think about that. It's a little bit hard. Like when you're out of the bubble of university and you have nothing, <laughs> if you only have these, yeah. So it. We take this as a no, I guess. <laughs> so in, in, in short, um, actually, part of that's a good question because we have also different cases. For example, we have data sets which only asks you uh, to, to describe why, why you are willing to use the data set. So basically, you enter your email address, your name, and a sh short description. But it is still un under, under this um, somehow information wall, I, I would say. It's not open, but sometimes we regard them as, as open data sets, right? So it looks... From, uh, from the data provider point of view, which are mostly research institutions, a very naive uh, information, f which is also for your, for your needs, right? So they want to know who is using their data, and maybe we can connect to that, your, your command. So who is using the data for which purposes? They want to learn, so they want to get f feedback about, about the da da data they produce. But it provides a kind of wall to access. So um, uh, it's really partly a dif difficult um, Topic, let's say, to to to, to cover. I I, I I agree with that. Um, if, the, if the license is open, at least uh, you can make. You, you know, if the license is open, you can at least make your own copy, and and then you can say, well, we I do unrestricted access, so I convert it to cloud optimized. You know, so definitely the license is the most important. But you could have something nominally open license and but not really accessible, not usable, um, not optimized, uh, you know, and, uh, and then it's on the edge, it's a gray, a gray area. A true open data, if it's optimized for use, unrestricted access, uh, open format, cloud optimized, that's the only true open data. That's the gold standard, I think. That's what we should all go for if, we are, if you're claiming to be open data. And eventually we should have some of standard of open data. We have standards, you know, for many things, OGC, da, da, da. We should have standards for open data. Did something get a open data certificate or something? Uh, and uh, maybe Open Geohub could play here a bit role uh, because we don't have financial interest. We would just like, you know, to help people understand and tidy up and, and do some minimum quality control. You know, that's what we could do. And we will try to do that with the open land map. We will host other people' data, uh, but we need to uh, we need to make sure that it's uh, prepared so it's a maximum usability. Yes, Alice. Um, yeah, I, I I agree with you, and I like the the summary. So, what uh, I wanted to to add also, I I think. Um, it should be. It should not be like the cost. Maybe a small cost, like uh, for downloading a data set which uh, is made open, should not be like a barrier for someone to feel that uh, he or she has contributed. Because uh, I think also making a data set open, it, it costs something. It can be an effort or also money. Because uh, I remember when we discussed about. Uh, writing or publishing um, a data paper, yeah? Uh, it also costs money, and open access uh, 
article, you always pay money. Yeah, so that's what I wanted to add. So, yeah, it's always balancing and uh, start with uh, making the, the data set open uh, by providing an open access a license and also open format. Um, yeah, provide enough documentation for other people to be able to understand the data and reuse the data. Yeah. There's also journals you, you don't have to pay to publish, uh, but they are too, too, too tough to get to. Uh, yeah, but, they, but they do exist. There will be hopefully more and more. Yeah. We are working on one journal to be free, no, uh, no uh, article process charges, yeah. Okay, so actually with this open geodata, we are partly in a, a, a difficult um, uh, waters because in addition to all the problems of open data in, in, in general, so because some of these are in fact open data, data, data problems, we have also problems coming fr from, from the special components of this, all the data formats, uh, data, data being too, too large, etc. cetera. So, um, so it's partly difficult to find uh, solutions to problems which are not solved at the general level, at the open data level, for example, right? For example, data, uh, data journals, because this is, from my point of view, partly a large problem, so not specific to a geospatial domain. But what we can do, in fact, maybe with initiatives which are in the geospatial domain, we can be examples, actually, for, for these kind of things. So if it can be possible to have open journals with, without fees to publish the, the, the data, that might, in fact, a, a forerunner in, in, in open data in, in general, which could be, could be really nice. Um, uh, one difficulty is, in fact, uh, the data repositories, um, because one, sometimes we need to use certified data repositories. Um, and partly, unfortunately, existing structure is not very uh, special data fr friendly. Uh, so the metadata lacks special components, the data formats that are supported are usually not, not very much in line. So uh, it looks like we have also some integration uh, problems there as well. Even if we have technologies like GeoNode, as you mentioned. So I, I think uh, converting GeoNode uh, to a proper data, a geospatial data repository, which has DOI uh, support, is not very difficult compared to converting the existing data repository platforms to host proper geospatial data. Um, but unfortunately, the discussion is not that level. So um, partly it looks like we are reinventing the wheel uh, again and again, so, um, which seems to be, to be a challenge. And the, to and the last of the, uh, but the most important thing is to make a business of open data, mm -hmm. which, is, uh, which is also uh, complex, you know, yeah. but it's possible. Yeah. Um, and uh, there are many now examples. We discussed that uh, two years ago. Like if you take uh, mobile phone industry, the, the actually number one open source in the world is Android, right? It's the biggest. It's the uh, highest number of copies and biggest number of developers, Android. And it's a huge business, uh, right? But it's open source, right? So you with the open data also, you can, um, there are business models, you know, OpenStreetMap has a business model. And some business people, how, how can you make business if you don't sell the data? But it's like, how do you make, you're from Android, also huge businesses. Yeah. It's, uh, right, it's possible. It's definitely uh, possible. And um, so like European Commission, European Space Agency, Copernicus uh, images open. So they don't make any money selling it, but it generates revenue. It's possible if you track it, and that's what they did with Landsat. With Landsat, they uh, were selling Landsat, you know, up to uh, which year, like 2005 or something. You had to buy, I mean, I remember I, I bought my first Landsat image, I paid $2,000 $2, because I had to pay import taxes. And so just the one image, I was so happy, I was like, oh, I got this Landsat satellite image, you know? And it was $2,000. And um, and then they estimated the, uh, the cost they set up and to get the whole world Landsat, I think, will cost a billion, I don't know. Right? So, so nobody ever went to get the whole world. And, but then when they estimate if they release the data and then people build up applications on top of it, so they build up a whole industry which is uh, 50 times bigger than the cost of their image, right? And then they just collect taxes from that 50 times higher. And then they discover it was, it was actually the, 
uh, financially, the most logical thing was to open it, right? So, <laughs> so it was uh, it, it paid off itself. I think when they opened the data, the Lancet whole Lancet project paid off itself uh, within a year or something. I, I don't know now. I'm, I'm guessing, but it was very short time. It paid itself off. Yeah, uh, actually, so. geospatial domain is full of these kind of examples. A nice one, I believe, is the GPS. Because um, I'm not sure if you remember, GPS had uh, actually um, 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 error uh, Selective introduced. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so eventually, normal hand hand uh, GPS, they didn't have the accuracy that we had now. So, uh, but they, they turned off this and basically they opened high, high uh, accuracy GPS to yeah, applications. And now we have, every, each of us has a GPS, right? At least one, so maybe even more. So, um, so uh, there are many opportunities like, like this. Uh, open source also is a nice example. Open source, we say it's open, etc. But in fact, there are quite big companies who, who, who generate revenue by providing support to, to open source, right? Like, like Red Hat. We have also many examples from, from geospatial uh, software. So maybe it will come also to, well, as you mentioned, there's also uh, existing examples for data. But even for the data sets that you create, it might be possible. So maybe that could be. And the message that we that we can have. So um, eventually, there are many components of this, um, and um, hopefully, we can uh, we can work together on this, uh, uh, collaborate not only to generate uh, open data sets, but also uh, to come up with some solutions about the problems that we are talking about. So, how to make the data more accessible? Uh, how, how, what uh, what could be a good way to to publish actually? So. The, if there is a need to improve the data repositories, maybe we can actually help with that, right? Because we have also the, the, the developers. Um, or um, maybe uh, we can also work on more training, because as you mentioned, now you can, you can do it, because uh, you spend time to learn on, on, on this, and partly you, you, um, um, uh, as a new generation, I, I, I will tell, you are more familiar with this kind of technologies anyway, with interactive notebooks, with Python programming, et cetera. But still, there is a large group of people who need support, help and support uh, to be able to use uh, the new uh, state of the art technology. So maybe we can also collaborate on this uh, together, so for education and for capacity development activities. Um, so with this, actually, um, maybe it's time for a coffee. Uh, I think we all deserve it. Uh, third outside, uh, please help yourself. And then a tough session is waiting for us. I will be honest with you, because we have the lightning talks from, from PhDs, so they waited all the day <laughs> for this time to come. Uh, so it will be a challenge, I can tell you. I, I look at your, some of your presentations. I saw the number of slides that you have. That's a kind reminder, you have five minutes. So please be careful. Uh, so there's some time also for, for questions, but uh, you will see my warning for two and one minutes. So good luck, we are looking forward for it. But first- Three o'clock, right, from three we start? Yes, yes, at, okay. at three. So we have okay. 10 minutes for, for, okay. for coffee break, okay?